Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. This is Rona Palmer, the Marketing Director at eMain Enterprises and thanks for joining us today for this month's Best Practices webinar. And I'm very pleased to have with me on the line a new speaker, but he's by no means new to this industry and that's Jim Hall, the Executive Director of Ultras Technologies. And he's going to be presenting today's topic, which is ultrasound for reliability maintenance. And before I turn things over to Jim, I did just want to clarify something for our listeners out there because eMaint does host such a variety of webinars that we often have people showing up for the wrong session. But our best practices series really focus on maintenance strategies and not on any particular software package or on eMain software. So we invite really industry experts from a variety of industries to share their their knowledge um, with our listeners, some of whom are eMain clients, but I know that many of you are not. So Jim, I know that, um, are you with me there, Jim? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Great. Um, Jim, you know, while our listeners are kind of logging in, maybe you can just take a moment, and you've been in this industry for such a long time, I see from your background from the Navy and from a variety of clients, been in the ultrasound industry, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the recent trends that you've seen. We've certainly seen a lot of interest based on our registrants today, increasing interest in this type of technology. What trends are you seeing in the industry today? Well, currently, Rona, I, um, along with the Association of Maintenance Professionals, published a guidelines for acoustic lubrication of electric motors using ultrasound, of course. And it's a process that uh, I myself have been involved with since about 1990. And um, it just finally matured to a point where a lot of industries are giving it a second and third look. And actually, uh, uh, several companies that have actually implemented this have found that it's a quite a saver of uh, time and motor maintenance. But that's one of the biggest trends right now. The other, of course, is the uh, application of ultrasound for electrical inspection to detect corona tracking and arcing and switch gear and also substation maintenance. One of the biggest problems there is uh, some people have just gotten too complacent thinking that infrared is a you know a do-all for that, but Ultrasound is one of those uh, applications where the scanning inspection can be done prior to ever opening switch gear and the chances of, of a good ultrasound instrument, and I stress good ultrasound instrument, one that has the sensitivity to hear beyond the doors, to hear the corona, the track getting arcing must be used. But those are the two biggest trends right now with ultrasound. Well, excellent. And you know, Jim, I know that we have listeners today from, you know, a variety of industries and all types of equipment, so it'll be very educational to learn about the different applications. Um, before I just turn things over to Jim, um, to who'll take us through about a 45-minute presentation, he agreed to stay through the entire session and uh, through the end of the hour as needed and answer any questions that you might have. I do have the phone on mute because I'm recording today's session, and we'll be happy to share a link with all of the people that attended today. Um, and we'll do so after we later today after we render the recording. Uh, so please, if you do have a question for Jim, I have your phones muted, but please just type the question in the question box and go to webinar at any time, and I'll go ahead and read them to Jim at the end of the session. All right, so um, I'll go ahead, Jim, and turn things over to you. All right, well, thank you, Rona. Again, I'm Jim Hall. I'm the executive director of the Ultrasound Institute. Uh, she first introduced me as the Ultrasound Technologies, but we've actually gone through a rebranding process recently because I had several people uh, with my extensive background in the sales of ultrasound thinking that I was still involved with the sales. I'm actually vendor neutral. I sell no, no product, no, no instruments whatsoever, but that doesn't mean I don't opinion of what's going to be best for your particular application for your particular industry. Uh, as far as my background, um, you know, TUI pr provides not only just level one and level two, but it's a specific topic uh, as far as training in the use of airborne ultrasound and airborne being it could be contact or it could be airborne like for leak detection or electrical scanning. 
Uh, previously, I was with uh, SVT North America as a sales manager, uh, UE Systems as a regional manager and sales southeast regional manager, <clears throat> Naval Air Engineering. Uh, prior to that, I was a in, uh, an instructor, a tech rep on the F-18 Hornet program and taught everything other than electronics, so composites, um, ultrasound for applications there, not just in non-destructive testing, but uh, we actually were using ultrasound, uh, which we're here to talk about today, for leak detection of airborne scanning systems as well as bearings and uh, flight controls. Uh, I'm also a contributing editor for Uptime Reliability magazine. Let's look at a few of the general applications for ultrasound. Leak detection, of course, is by far the most widely used uh, for compressed air. But cryogenic gases, nitrogen, helium, stuff of that nature uh, is another method. Um, people are just starting to learn more about tone method, tone generator being the what we've always used in the aviation and industrial uh, markets as far as the vessel testing. We would place a tone generator, uh, sometimes known in the RC UE systems as a warble tone generator, or SDT, called a bisonic tone generator. And this can be placed into a closure and then inspect it for integrity of that enclosure. Underground leak detection, even though I've written articles about using ultrasound for underground leak detection, and I own an underground leak detection business in Atlanta, um, ultrasound is not primarily what's used for underground leak detection. It's just an application that it could be used for. Low frequency or sonic is best for that application. Mechanical inspections, uh, bearing analysis, acoustic lubrication, pumps, pumps for cavitation and bearings. And then, of course, steam traps and the electrical inspection, as I mentioned earlier, for arcing and tracking, corona discharge, uh, 1 kV or higher, and destructive corona. Valve inspections, this would be internal condition positioning of valves as well as leak through or bypassing of a closed valve or seats. As far as an overview, let's look at the uh, the normal range of human hearing is below 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Sounds above this range, 20 to 20,000 hertz or 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, is thought of as ultrasound. Ultrasound is short wave typically an eighth of an inch to five eighths of an inch in length. Industrial applications process includes varying degrees of friction that have ultrasonic components, leaks, bearings, steam traps, and electrical. Your ultrasound companies, they either heterodyne or they demodulate the received ultrasonic signal. The signal is converted to a low frequency or recognized an audible signal. And Jim, at any point, do we want to perhaps ask the poll question about the current usage of? Uh, now, now would be a good time for that poll question. Let's go ahead. Would that, that be okay? Certainly. All right, folks. Um, Jim has put together a couple of poll questions to just sort of get a feel for who's uh, out there on our listeners today, because obviously this is highly technical, and you know it'll help him know what to delve into. So, kind of just maybe you can type your responses right in and let Jim know um, who's on the line with us today. These answers are just done in aggregate, anonymously. There's no wrong answer, but please go ahead and let us know, are you currently utilizing ultrasound? Yes or no, because you don't see the need, or perhaps know that you might like to, but you just don't have the manpower to do it at this point in time. So it looks like we have about two-thirds of the votes in. I'll leave the poll open for a few more seconds. Okay, let's go ahead then and share the results. So Jim, it does look like 18% say they have a program in place. I guess they're trying to learn more about latest technology. 37% are saying they don't see the need, but I guess are revisiting it anyway. And 45% say they lack the manpower, um, and that's the reason why they don't do it. All right, well, Jim, I'll go that's, ahead. That's an interesting poll. I mean, when we look at, if you leave it up just for a second, but, uh, you know, when we look at the utilization of ultrasound, yes, you know, others have it. And then 37%, we don't see the need. If you're one of those that plans on having a world-class maintenance program, 
you need ultrasound. You can't have a world-class maintenance program without an ultrasound program. Just in, in its likelihood of bearings, when you're not being able to use your vibration uh, for motors, for instance, there's ultrasound. And just if you have any compressed air, ultrasound. But anyway, we can talk more about that in uh, some other schools. But as far as the reliability of maintenance in ultrasound, uh, what you're seeing here on the screen now is the SDT-270 and the SDT's ultra analysis software. And in its use, as far as the uh, use of the SDT-270, uh, there's a lot of applications there as far as the uh, listing for uh, bearing analysis to using their accelerometer to look at uh, G's as well. So there, it's highly advanced in terms of, of its use and what it's capable of doing, including recording the wave file and being able to play it back in their software so you can look at through FFTs or time waveform. Here we will see a screen of uh, what I'm using there. It's a, in this particular case, an Ultra Pro 9000. Uh, as far as what you're seeing on the screen, though, the FFTs, uh, you're looking at what was uh, taken with an Ultra Pro uh, 15000, and then the wave file played back through the UE Systems Ultra Analysis software. Um, spectral analyzer and you can see the faults that are represented with some sideband noise and, and that's something that um, we were able to see at this particular water park uh, filtration pumps and uh, looking at the um, outside uh, non-drive-in bearing and of course that showing that it's a inner race problem. Uh, the other two screens there at the bottom left or it would represent uh, with the UltraPro 15000, we were able to see FFTs and time waveform on the screen at the same time. And this is an in-field use, an in-field screen that you're seeing there on this bottom two. The one on the right in the, in the center, a um, the little screen there, that's the display of the UltraPro 15000 designating uh, 32 decibels. It also has a temperature uh, probe in it, so you're actually seeing 70.2 degrees Fahrenheit as well as far as the uh, record number being number one. And so uh, just to give you a glimpse of what this what the screen would look like. Now, focus on applications, though, motor analysis, the bearing inspections, the acoustic lubrication, those are two of the real issues as far as ultrasound. The, the bearing inspection, if you go back to, you know, I got started in this industry in 1988 as far as picking up an ultrasound and using it on aircraft and a aviation uses. And then in the early 90s, it was apparent to me that ultrasound was really getting uh, a lot of interest in terms of the bearing applications, using ultrasound to listen to the bearings. And at that time, I was using an Ultra Probe 2000. We were using 30 kilohertz as our standard as far as uh, our setup and linear time averaging to listen to the bearings. And even back as far as 1993, I was doing acoustic lubrication with that instrument. It would take two people at that time, but we were able to accomplish uh, the actual acoustic lubrication. The electrical inspections came later in the mid-1990s as far as the first time listening to corona and tracking and arcing. But I also knew at that time this was something that could either save lives, prevent uh, a loss of, of a panel, or a loss of an apparatus. The signal analysis, the FFTs and the time waveform, has just been something that has been uh, promoted more widely over the last uh, few years. People are getting more and more used to the idea of taking a wave file and playing it back through waveform, whether it's FFTs or time waveform, or using your own uh, spectral analyzer with your, um, your own uh, vibration unit, just taking the wave file that you recorded and using it as a sound file. Analog to digital, um, as I stated, I've been in this industry since 88 in terms of the, my first use of an ultrasound unit. Analog to digital, I saw the loss of sensitivity because once you take a in, analog instrument and make it digital, the, the very highs and the very lows are, are, are gone you're going to lose something. So for me, for having been already been using this unit for some seven to eight years prior to our first digital unit being the uh, Ultra Probe 9000, 
I, I thought my cells were going to suffer, but uh, at that time, I was. It took me a little bit to get used to the fact that this was the first instrument allowing us to data log the ultrasound readings and store them. At that time, it was 400 readings, two points, four points per reading. So that's all we could put in there. But um, you know, that was still the only one that was able of doing that at the time. Um, we were able to take a, a digital recorder. Uh, as well as a, I, a lot of times I was using a Sony Walkman recorder and tape recorder and actually uh, plug it in with a splitter to the headphone jack to split the signal so that I could record the bearing sounds or the electrical sounds and store them on my computer. So I built myself a, a library of WAV files. And that was the FDT-170. There was the 150 prior to that, another very good unit. Looked very similar as far as the 170 size and and the weight was a little heavier than the 170. And now, of course, there are 270s, the more bands. The Ultra Probe 10,000, I thought, was a, an excellent instrument. I think our biggest problem with the 10,000, as far as my customers, were getting used to the actual uh, trying to navigate around the screen using the uh, click and spin technology, the single button there. Once I was able to explain to them if they would just think of it in terms of a clock face, the uh, rotation being clockwise, push, spin, push, spin, but in a clockwise manner, um, just try to remember where it was blinking and what you would be coming up on next. So once you could get the guys that uh, typically by you know the early 2000s, everybody had smartphones and get the guys to realize, well, gee, if you can navigate through your smartphone, you can definitely can navigate through an UltraPro 10,000. So that's been um, a real issue with a lot of companies. The industry's changed, though, since 1997-98. The analog and the high sensitivity, but we're limited to data managing, no download. We use cassettes and digital recorders. That was uh, limited use. The digital, we have still relatively good sensitivity, enormous amount of data storage, onboard recording, whether it's WAV files or MP3s, on-screen FFTs, and time series. But motor analysis or bearing inspection, in my case, what I uh, was looking at here was a 50 horsepower motor. This was a uh, water park in the Atlanta area. Um, filtration pump outboard bearing, 1,750 RPMs, 10 balls. The inner race showed the harmonics with the sideband noise and never before seen in the field with an ultrasound instrument that was uh, represented up to that point. I will say, when you're looking at the back of my Ultra Probe 15,000 there, you're seeing the FFTs, or excuse me, the uh, time waveform. And clearly, uh, as far as their faults and indications there, but the other FFT uh, screen that I showed earlier in the presentation, and I'll talk about it a little bit later as well, showed the faults coming up at 1750 as far as a one time. But then the sideband noise that were there are clearly indicative of an inner race. Now, I personally, when I went back to check that bearing after 30 days, unfortunately, that company had just in, uh, employed the use of FF, uh, not FFTs, but um, um, variable speed drives. And they actually had burnt the motor up before I could get a second reading to see just where that uh, inner race uh, problem had, was going. And um, so, and I go in there frequently still listening to some of their bearings. And it is a challenge with the uh, VSDs, but it can be done. Now here's the screen I'm talking about. With the uh, ultra analysis software, or the, not the ultra, but the spectral analyzer, UV spectral analyzer. You see up at the top of the screen the whites uh, with the faults and the sideband noise and the other three um, that I showed along with it, the other three motors side by side. So there was no indication there that it was just that one that we were showing a problem with. As to the right, you see a bearing calculator and that, that allows us to, to put in the 1750, the 10 balls and hitting the radio buttons would allow us to choose whether or not it was a inner race or outer race or ball pass frequency or cage. In this case, again, as soon as we press the inner uh, race button, 
uh, the harmonics lined up perfectly with the faults that you see in there in the screen. And this um, view here, what you're seeing is the, again the faults there and normally this would be a, a video but we were un unable to play this video on this particular presentation and we'll be glad to forward you something like this if you like, just a, a matter of getting in contact with me and letting me know if you would like to have uh, some uh, facts on this particular, what you're seeing here. But uh, again, in fact, this is what the software looks like on my computer. And again, we're able to uh, include the 1750 RPM with 10 balls. I want to switch over to ultrasound for acoustic lubrication. And mainly because a lot of you uh, know that we've been involved with acoustic lubrication. And this is a, a group of the men that worked with me on this. Uh, we were using the Association of Maintenance Professional and their um, uh, what they call VSEG, the Ver uh, Virtual Special Interest Group. And this allowed myself to employ the, uh, these other men and use go to meeting in, in a sense to uh, meet with these guys several months, uh, several days over the months. And we pounded out this uh, guideline for accusing lubrication of element bearings, rolling element bearings in electric motors. And this is available for download as a matter of getting in touch with me and I'll be glad to talk to you more about that. Acoustic lubrication is a method of using bearings, ultrasound signal to determine a bearing requires lubrication or if the lubrication is sufficient. And under lubricated bearing will generate a greater signal than a properly lubricated bearing. The signals are measured in decibels or dB ohm volt in the case of SDT1, the 270s and 170s. Once lubrication of a specific piece of equipment is managed with an acoustic lubrication program, it's recommended that you put policies in place to prevent inadvertent lubrication by others not working within the acoustic lubrication program. I can't stress that enough. To have somebody come in and just do the old method of pumping grease into it until they'll see bearing, uh, grease coming out of the bearing or just, um, you know, like one uh, company had told me that Old Joe um, had already retired, but we used to always put seven full strokes of the grease gun in. Seven full strokes of the grease gun could be a, a one ounce of grease. It could be two ounces of grease. Depends upon your particular grease gun. And um, acoustic lubrication, while I'm thinking about it, we don't use a battery operated or electric grease gun when we're doing acoustic lubrication. It's very hard to control the amount of grease when you put that finger on and you pull that trigger on those electric guns to be able to give it a small sampling of grease. Rolling element bearings are designated as ball bearing, rolling bearing, and needle bearings. Thereafter referred to as bearings or bearings that are also known as anti-friction bearings. Your setup. The recommended means of introducing grease is a pistol type grease gun that has been cleaned, tested, and has a known output capacity. Powered grease guns, as I mentioned earlier, can pump as much as a half ounce per second and are not recommended due to the ability to quickly pump excess amounts of grease. Basic connection, attach the grease gun to the grease fitting and attach, touch the ultrasonic sensor to the closest point on the housing to the bearing. Advanced connection, attach the ultrasonic unit and the grease gun together on the grease fitting. One combined adapter, the grease tube or most equipment attaches, attaches close to the bearing and is a repeatable location, a custom adapter allows for the sensor and grease gun to attach in the grease tube and provide a dB level of the practitioner as they, can, as they are greasing the bearing. Better repeatability can be also accomplished with a button head grease fitting that applies a constant probe content pressure than a Zerk grease fitting that relies on the practitioner to supply the probe contact pressure. So typically when we're talking about a button and hook setup, this is what you're seeing here in this picture. You see the button, it's got threads. You simply, when you want to adapt your unit to where you're using the button hook, you remove the Zerk fitting and place the button with the threads, screw it in. And then the adapter, which is the larger piece there in the bottom of the picture, um, it attaches to that button hook and it gives you more of a secure reading and the tighter that fitting is, uh, as far as having your sensor attached to it as well, the better the signal you're going to get. 
Now what you see in this particular picture here is you see the SDT um, sensor as it's been uh, incorporated with the uh, button and hook adapter. And this is a, a good strong signal. Um, what I'm finding is this is an excellent means to add uh, acoustic lubrication as a condition based monitoring program as well. Not just for acoustic lubrication but a condition based monitoring program. So the practitioner must be trained and knowledgeable in the operation of the ultrasound receiver selected. To accurately measure the ultrasound signal, the bearing and ultrasound pickup is mechanically attached as close as possible to the bearing or source of the signal in an exactly the same location for future reading. Ultrasound has always been about apples to apples and oranges to oranges. You, know, you come back to take a reading on a bearing, you come back to the same point. In this case, we're talking about the Zerk fitting, the button and hook setup, always come back using the same process. Keep your readings um, the same. The configuration of this equipment is to be lubricated, must be accurately known. Do not switch greases in a grease gun. Dedicated grease gun accessories for specific grease and stick with them to avoid cross-contamination. New bearings should run in for one to two days before taking an ultrasound reading with a new bearing. If first installed, it requires runtime in order to manifest an ultrasonic signature. Typically, an eight to nine hours minimum runtime before you try to apply an acoustic lubrication application. It's recommended to compare the current ultrasonic reading to the previous reading. This will help indicate the condition of the equipment and assist in determining the amount of lubrication needed. Repeatability of these measurements require using the same measuring method and setup each time. The speed and load of the machine should also be duplicated. This is what you're going to see in a normal trend when we're picking up any ultrasound instrument to use it for trending bearings. Is same readings, previous reading, the same setup in terms of the same frequency. If you set your instrument up to use 38.4 kilohertz as an SDT or 30 kilohertz for UE, or if you have an instrument that doesn't have uh, tunable frequency, adjustable frequencies, you're typically going to be at 40 kilohertz plus or minus 5 or plus or minus 10, depending upon the manufacturer. Accurate record keeping is essential. The lower some of the recommended metrics to document for each point. Your date, your original baseline, the last ultrasonic reading, the types of grease used, the amount of grease delivered, the motor speed, motor load, current reading from VFD if used, the ambient temperature, the bearing temperature, sound recording, technician taking readings. Now these are these are all you know, this is perfect in terms of the best case, but we know that a number of you are not going to go to this extent. So the biggest thing we're looking at is the date, the last known reading, a baseline if you've been able to acquire a baseline which is recommended of course. And then um, watching this over a period of time whether it's 30, 60, or 90 days. In case of doing your acoustic lubrication, if you start using the ultrasound as a condition-based monitoring, you're going to see a real decrease in motor maintenance. Knowing how much grease can be delivered per stroke of the grease gun is essential. Many motor manufacturers recommend a specific amount of grease to be delivered per run time hours. This may prove useful as an initial guide. The simple way to measure grease output per stroke is to discharge the grease into a one ounce container, shot glass, count the number of strokes required to fill the container. Calculate the amount of grease per stroke from this information. Electronic grease measuring devices are commercially available. These devices make totaling a grease delivered easier. Now, having said that, I would say that we've actually matured to a point where we're not really looking as much as uh, we used to in terms of how much grease did you just deliver, but um, more or less it's just we're, we're it's all about watching the decibels. If we start to put grease into the bearing and say we start it at 37 decibels, a half a stroke of the grease gun, or if you absolutely have to use a battery powered or electric grease gun, pull the trigger 1001, let go and to try to help simulate a half stroke of the grease gun. The idea is to watch those decibels go down. 
So say we start at 37, we shoot a half a stroke of the grease gun, and the DB doesn't move. Another half stroke. We pause, another half stroke. We're still sitting at 37 decibels. Another half stroke. The decibels start to go down. Now we've just noticed that we've put probably two full strokes of grease would be the equivalent, and we knew that that bearing needed some grease. Now, on the other hand, had we put a half stroke of the grease into that bearing, and those decibels went up to 38, 39 decibels. Um, we're going to pause. We're going to give it a few seconds, depending upon the ambient temperature, and see if it returns to what it was when we first put the grease gun on and the uh, ultrasonic reading. So if it doesn't come back to 37 or doesn't drop below 37, hey, we're done greasing. That bearing didn't need any grease. But you haven't done any real damage to it either. So again, that's the big thing is we don't want to increase the sound pressure in the bearing. We don't want to create a problem, but at the same time, that's an easy way of telling that uh, somebody's either pre-greased it prior to us getting it there, or the unit just has not, uh, is not using the grease. Ultrasound receivers and sensors are precise scientific devices, must be protected from handling, and proper handling can render them inaccurate. Ultrasound instruments with a digital output can give more useful readings and firm numbers. Analog meters rely on the same degree of the user's interpretation. For greatest accuracy, consider using a digital display. In this slide, you're seeing the UltraProbe 15000 on the left, uh, an SCT270 on the right, and an UltraProbe 2000 analog instrument. On the analog, just to give you an idea, what you're seeing there is the sensitivity knob being the big black one. There is a window in the top of that that when we're uh, turning that, we'll have two sets of numbers. So say, for instance, I had 7.5, and that's what the, it would, uh, would equal if I had uh, those two numbers in that box up on the sensitivity knob itself. It's a 10-turn potentiometer. The analog meter uh, what you're seeing, the white meter there above in, this, in the left to right of the screen in the UltraProbe backplate, that 0 to 100 just represents a reference point. It doesn't represent any particular, uh, it doesn't mean 50, 60, 100 decibels. On the other hand, on that particular instrument, every 20 increments represents 3 decibels. In case of lubricating, using an UltraProbe 2000, we would bring the sensitivity once we touch the bearing, bring the sensitivity to where the needle is resting at 50% of that scale before we start to lubricate the bearing. If we see that that goes up, again, we would rest for a few seconds, see if it comes back down. If it doesn't, again, you could say, well, this doesn't need any grease after we've already pumped a half stroke or a full stroke, whatever we, our session we've done. When a motor is controlled by a variable frequency drive, the practitioner must be aware of how the carrier frequency of the VFD can skew acoustic readings. Now I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. The VFDs have better filtering. This effect is less pronounced. The main point is to capture significant changes in dB readings from previous readings. The use of permanently mounted sensors is encouraged as this provides the best repeatability. When using a magnetic sensor, the measurement point should be clearly identified with repeatability. I caution you on the magnetizers. Have a good, clean surface, and take the time to turn your uh, magnetic sensor, uh, depending upon the poles. You might even use a reference point on the magnet by placing a dot of paint at the 12 o'clock position, for instance. And as you roll that magnet, and I did say roll that magnet onto the base of that motor. You don't want to just let it smack onto the motor. You can damage the piezoelectric transducer. So when a handheld probe is used, the practitioner must be experienced in exerting the um, correct pressure to hold the probe into the tip uh, onto the reading point. As here, you can see, the again, the SDT sensor mounted to a button hook. The right-hand picture is using an UltraProbe contact probe where we've taken a, um, an EXE2000 extension cable and plugged in the contact probe and then screwed that into a short rod and adapted it to the um, hook point uh, adapter as well. 
a lot of times you'll see me refer to both UE and SDT. Those are the two major instruments that are out there right now as far as the sales goes in the, the industry. I know there's others. I have everyone's ultrasound instrument. But in terms of presentations and doing this online, I try to use what is the two of the most widely used instruments to uh, talk to the, uh, to the industry as far as the presentation. There are two common grease fittings, and that's the Zerk and the button head type. With an ultrasound grease endeavor is used, the button head type fitting is preferred as it allows for a more repeatable connection after the adapter is attached to a manual force is required. So to pull that button and hook onto it, you're getting a good tight uh, reading there. Let's go advance another slide. As far as the delivery, the layout and the length of the grease delivery route will be determined how the practitioner delivers grease to the bearing. Hard pipe grease delivery lines are prone to interfering with ultrasound signals and should not be used for this purpose. Uh, let's say that again. When we're using the grease button and hook setup and we have a, a sensor attached to the button and hook adapter, it's best not to use a metal pipe as far as the supply from the grease gun to the adapter where we're hooking up. The interference, that pipe could act as a waveguide so other competing ultrasound could be hitting that pipe and creating noises that uh, would not, uh, it's not what you're looking for. In other words, it could interfere with your, your reading. So using a rubber hose on your delivery hose from your grease gun to your, um, whether you're using the Zerk fitting or the button and hook style, uh, again, is advisable. If, if a, relief, a grease relief plug is installed, it must be open for proper operation. Grease release is installed, the plug should be removed prior to greasing. This picture you see in a friend of ours, um, Saul Cizek, with the uh, Upper Akawan Wastewater Treatment Plant using an Ultra Probe, um, I think that's a Grease Caddy um, 201, and uh, he's using a magnetic sensor attached to the Zerk fitting uh, as far as his delivery. Here you're seeing a, in the left-hand picture an SDT with its adapter and a 270. To the right, that's, um, I can't remember the exact name of this particular unit. I'm, I will think of it here in my head. I've just got so much going on right now. But that's a one of the earlier units. And that particular sensor, though, it, it, you know, it's, um, it's of the lowest in terms of around 20 kilohertz. And sometimes you get a little bit of interference from uh, having uh, that low of the kilohertz range. You're so close to the sonic range that some interference is uh, picked up when using that particular one. There is nothing that you can go by as far as a digital. You're simply using your ears to hear the inflection or the change when you're uh, delivering the grease to the bearing. Make certain the machine is running at operating temperature. Cold grease will not support the capillary action needed to properly move the oil into the bearing. Let's go to the next slide. Familiarize, familiarize yourself with the sounds of the bearings. A good bearing is going to have an even rushing sound, just like a, a fluidic shh, just a rushing sound. Lack of lubrication is going to be a slightly louder rushing sound. A bearing in failure could be crackling or rough. A damaged ball, clicking sound. A damaged ball, uh, that should have been, um, a damaged ray should be a clicking sound. A damaged ball should be, um, well, no, let's have that back. A damaged ball should have been a clicking sound. A damaged ray should be a uniform roughness. Uh, so that chart is wrong. My apologies. Um, but if we go over those, the damaged ball and inner rays, um, for instance, as far as the, uh, the race, uh, an interrace is going to have a clicking sound. So you could pretty much set your watch by hearing a click, 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 where if it's an outer race, it might be a, a little, uh, it's still going to have a click, and it's going to be uniform, but it might be a little bit more distance between the click versus the uh, quicker, because one being inner closer to the uh, shaft versus the outer race being uh, further away from the shaft. Um, as far as the ball, um, as far as what you're hearing there, you'll hear the ball hit the other balls, but it's going to rotate. It's going to be an intermittent uh, sound as far as the clicking goes. So even though a bearing is crackling, is rough, um, crackling or rough, doesn't mean that it's bad. It's, it could be that it's just merely going through the phases of certain de degradation as far as um, 
it's wearing down, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be replaced at this point. We are listening to the bearing to determine how much grease is needed. We're looking for a rising inflection point in the sound level being produced during the greasing process. This is the point where the adding the grease raises the dB sound level and the dB level does not return to the level that existed prior to the last stroke added. Note, we are looking for a rising inflection point in the greasing process. This is the point where adding the grease raises the dB level and the dB level does not return to the level that existed prior to the last stroke added. The practitioner should wait 10 to 20 seconds between grease additions and listen for signal and or dB change. If no changes are noted, the subsequent half to full stroke of the grease gun should be applied. Now, I've got to say again, even though what, what we've written in the guidelines, and there was a reason for that, of course, but the 10 to 20 seconds depend upon where you're at in the United States. You know, of course, a colder temperature, um, say my friends up at uh, Georgia Pacific and Englehart, uh, Englehart, Canada, I mean, Ontario, Canada, you're, you're cold weather, very, very cold, and uh, certain times of the year. So in their particular conditions, you may take longer than 10 to 20 seconds even. Uh, down in Florida, say um, Tropicana or Bradenton, Florida, um, certainly the uh, subtropical temperatures there, it may be as, uh, 5 to, to 10, 5 to 15 seconds. But, but the practitioner will continue applying half to full strokes of grease into the same fashion with the reason until the audible subtle changes, the louder, quieter, and or the DB changes. If an excessive amount of grease is applied without a response, the practitioner should stop and investigate further. The amount of grease delivered should be recorded. This will give you some reference as to what's going on. After adding grease, the dB level increase, one to three decibels or audible signal becomes louder. Stop adding the grease. Wait 30 to 90 seconds to see if the dB level drops to the dB level prior to the grease delivery. If the sound quality or, or has not improved, or if the dB level remains higher than the original starting level, no more grease should be added at this time. The bearing was already well lubricated. If the noise level is higher than desired, further investigation should follow. Next slide. After adding grease, the dB level changes slightly up or down. The audible signal becomes louder or softer because uh, pause adding grease with Wait 30 to 90 seconds to see if the dB level returns to the dB level prior to the grease delivery. If the sound level has or has not improved, or if the dB level remains or at the lower original starting level, continue repeating this process until the sound level and the dB level begins to rise. This is your inflection point. No more grease should be added at this time. This bearing was in need of relatively normal lubrication. This picture, you can see a, um, uh, this was a double spherical um, bearing uh, we used the acoustic lubrication on. Uh, this particular company had me in for uh, an ultrasound level one training, and part of the training we delivered an acoustic lubrication training as well. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to another slide. I'm going to, because of time factor, I want to move on. Um, as far as any questions on acoustic lubrication, please contact us. Any questions on any, um, as far as the ultrasound, whether it's leak detection, bearing analysis, mechanical analysis, uh, electrical scanning, I consider electrical scanning part of leak detection. Um, but feel free to contact us at any time. We'll be glad to go over that with you. Uh, Rona, are we um, set for the poll question, or let's, let's, let's at least do that second poll question. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a couple minutes for that. We're going to go ahead, and I guess this is uh, this is one we're checking if you're paying attention during the presentation here. But during the acoustic process, what is meant, or but during the lubrication, Jim just wants to confirm what is meant by the inflection point. Is it the point of no return? It's the point when the decibel lowers and greasing is stopped or it's the point in which the decibel rises. All right, and if you want to go ahead and um, give us your answers, 
and then we'll share them with Jim and have him clarify because that sounds like that was a very important point. And we have a lot of questions coming in after this poll question. We'll go ahead and open the floor, but please go ahead and um, type your questions in so that we can get as many answered by Jim and tap his expertise. All right, it looks like I'll close the poll and share it, but it looks like 39% of the people said it's the point when the decibel lowers, greasing is stopped. 61% said it's the point in which the decibel rises. Do you want to clarify that, Jim? Well, the 61% are correct. It's the point at which the decibel rises. Um, and so, yes, um, and again, as far as the acoustic lubrication, um, this is very important. So let's, uh, let's go on. Let's finish up with that last poll question before we open up the question as well. Sure. Okay. Now that you've kind of attended this webinar, and this might also help us for future topics, can ultrasound be a part of your condition-based monitoring? So we're going to go ahead and ask you that question and um, let us know are we on the right track here? Would you like to learn more? We asked at the beginning, and some people thought there wasn't a need. And now that Jim's shared some of his expertise, we're wondering. And I guess the no should be you're strictly, it's not necessarily only vibration. It sounds like you might use some different technology. Or you feel from what you've learned from Jim today that there could be a need for this as part of your condition-based monitoring system. All right, so we've got about two-thirds of the votes in. So, all right, let's go ahead and share the results. So, I think it's unanimous for the people replying. Excellent. They feel that you've, uh, all right, so we appreciate that. And, you know, we know it's always good to hear. We know you spend a lot of time and effort in sharing this information. So, um, I'll answer questions. I'll, Post questions to Jim and keep typing them till the end of the hour. If we run out of time, we'll share them with Jim afterwards. And um, you know, you can, we encourage you to reach out and keep the dialogue going. So, someone asked if you can use the process you described with wet bearings in a motor. Can you clarify that? Wet bearings could be difficult, when, especially if there's a, um, uh, as far as the lubricant you're using, um, or if you're talking about a wet bearing in terms of uh, it's being flushed or washed uh, from the side. But if it's a, a liquid grease that you're talking about, yes, this could still be used. It just depends on the, um, you know, if you're starving the bearing as far as the uh, liquid grease or oil uh, versus the other, other means, or if you're using a drip system. So it just depends on that particular application, that particular bearing. and and I would always suggest approaching it cautiously in that, but primarily this application was meant as uh, applying grease through a grease with a grease gun. Okay. And um, this same listener is asking if you have any suggestions, Jim, for how to promote adoption by the shop technicians, <clears throat> and specifically, how do you build confidence and belief in the value? And perhaps that could be amongst the technicians, but also, you know, even amongst the management. Well, when we look at the fact that, um, you know, not everybody has, uh, say, say you got um, 200 assets that you're having to lubricate, and you've got one vibration tech. That vibration tech may be, well, in almost all certainty, be overwhelmed. They'll never be able to get to all 200 motors do his vibration points along with his other collateral duties and the, the data logging and the, and the diagnosing and, and assessing as to what the readings are that he's getting. So what, what are you going to do with the other motors? Ultrasound is an excellent application in terms of trending and trying to keep track of what's going on with your motors. Adding acoustic lubrication as a condition-based monitoring is an excellent means of doing this. I, I uh, had one of our um, um, gentlemen that attended my class that came just to learn about acoustic lubrication at a level one class. Well, of course, I made him sit through three days. But he went back to his plant, which was a pulp paper mill, and he in adopted and implemented the ultrasound acoustic lubrication 
practice. Uh, little did I know, uh, 90 days later when I met up with him at a SMRP meeting, he stood up and told the whole class of 50 that the acoustic lubrication, once they implemented it, we were get, doing 37% less motor maintenance. Now, if that's not enough to get enough people's heads to turn and think about doing less motor maintenance, I don't know what else is going to help them. But this is a, an excellent way. It's, it's, it is the stories. It's the success stories that will get somebody excited about adopting the practice. Well, and um, let's just say that you know people are excited because the uh, you know the dollars and the savings and doing less maintenance on any kind of CBM program are so compelling. But obviously, people need to get trained, and we learned from the earlier poll that really manpower and staffing you know is such a constraint. So. What do you suggest there? Where can people go to kind of get that training? Or are there also, in addition, other services that they can tap into if they don't have trained personnel? Well, currently, I'm, I do a lot. Of course, I, um, I write for Uptime uh, Reliability Magazine, the ultrasound segment. But yeah, we're also, at this time, we're working. I'm uh, partnered with uh, reliabilityweb.com in order to create a certified reliability leader badge in the ultrasound. And so companies that really don't see themselves sending anybody to a level one, level two uh, program at this particular time may well want to look at the ultrasound badging, which will give them a, an interest as well as knowledge as to the ultrasound applications and, and will also help build that army of ultrasound users. I can't stress enough as far as the use of ultrasound, electrical applications uh, particularly, but also with the use of ultrasound for that money saving, energy saving for compressed air leaks, steam leaks, steam trap analysis. Uh, you can't have a world-class maintenance without ultrasound. Well said. Um, another question from a listener was, uh, could ultrasound analysis be used in conjunction with setting up uh, PF curves? Yes. You know, one of the biggest problems with ultrasound, and I, I call it a problem because early on being in this interest, industry since 88, I noticed that we would hear a bearing click. You know, we could hear the clicking. We could hear whether it was an outer race or just the balls out around or flat spots on the balls particularly with the analog instrument. Well, ultrasound is your first indication of where before vibration and before heat. So why aren't we using ultrasound instead of vibration analysis? Because vibration has its place. There's four categories that it's giving you, cat one, two, three, and four, four being the highest, being your catastrophic condition. Ultrasound, on the other hand, can be very subjective having the earliest indication. but also, if you're able to pick up on it at the earliest indication being ultrasound and say before again vibration, before b vibration equipment be became affordable, it was ultrasound. And that's one of the things we have to look at as far as that P and F curve. And is the early detection, it, it goes to reason. If the decibels are going up, there is a reason. And yes, we know that it, say, uh, when bearings get to a, uh, to a certain uh, range and the ultrasonic frequency uh, levels off when it gets to a, a certain point. Vibration still is picking up that bearing degradation as it goes through that particular area where ultrasound may stop rendering a condition but because of the leveling off, but the vibration still has those readings that it's going to be able to continue. And that's a lot of times I will push my attendees to incorporating ultrasound as a condition-based monitoring, but when there's a condition where the bearing decibel has set such a high reading and it's over a period of time is tracking high, regardless of lubricating it, it doesn't come back down, meaning there is something going wrong, I say employ the use of your vibration guy. Next call, call him out there, get him to come over and take a reading on that on that bearing and see how much longer you can go if you're not you know, it depends upon its criticality of that particular asset. Interesting. That's a great uh, 
that's a great way to employ each of the technologies to different situations. Um, we have another question. Is ultrasound usable on lower RPM bearings, uh, in this case a conveyor drive or a tail pulley, something with the lower RPMs? Typically down to 25 RPMs, uh, what you would probably, yeah, a lot of time. But having said that, I've been to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and other, other locations, particularly JPL, California with the radar size when you're looking at one and a half to two RPMs and if you take and record that one to two RPMs getting a minimum of nine revolutions you can shrink that wave file down to look for those faults that might be there but but as just being in the factory and looking at a slow speed uh, reading yes you still would want to take your ultrasound over and listen to it just try to make sure you stick around long enough to get that nine revolutions minimum. But you're also still looking for and listening for that popping, the crackling sound. But also I would encourage you that if there's a uh, heavy grease that's being used on those slow speeds, sometimes you can actually hear the whip of that, uh, not a whip, not the correct term, but the uh, sound of, of grease and the balls coming out of that grease, the, the, almost like a, a um, a flapping or a slapping noise, but it's actually just the releasing of the ball and the grease and that release sound. So there is something to be said about using ultrasound for slow speed bearings. I've been very successful over the years doing that. Very good. You mentioned, Jim, the various courses and the level one training. For people that are planning, uh, how long typically do you find a training takes for someone to be able to be trained to do this repeatedly and successfully? Typically we find a one to two day class on site using your instrument in your environment the best methodology as far as getting somebody used to the ultrasound. However, that's not always feasible. A lot of companies may only have one or two people they want to get assigned to ultrasound. They may choose to send them to a level one class where there's a three day. All we typically like for you to do is have some knowledge of the instrument that you have on site. But at the same time, we get a lot of attendees that come in saying, we don't have an instrument, but we want to learn more about ultrasound. Typically the level one class is not for that. But at the same time, it is what it is. If you come to a class, particularly my class, I have everybody's instrument, CTRL, uh, Ultrafonic 101, the STT 270, 170, parabolic dishes, the UE 2000, 9000, 10000, 15000, we have all of them. And we're able to uh, give you an instruction on the use of ultrasound, but also if you have a particular instrument, be able to give you some one-on-one -on -one training in between break times and it before and after a class to make sure that you understand the instrument um, that, you're, that you're using or that you would like to use. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jim. I am afraid that we're running up against the top of the hour. And um, so we'll be ending the webinar now. But I, I would like to thank Jim for sharing his knowledge. But please don't let the dialogue stop here. We will be sharing um, a link to the recording at the end of the session. and. Um, we also have a survey that we'll put up as soon as I end the webinar asking if you'd like to receive some additional information. Um, so thanks again, Jim. These are always highly educational. And also for our listeners out there, let us know what other topics, you know, Jim and people like him have such a wealth of knowledge. Do we want to cover more about the theory or about how you sell this internally to your to your management or um, how do you utilize the different technologies? Please let us know what other topics we can bring to you with speakers like Jim um, that will really be helpful to you. So thank you so much, Jim, for putting this together and for sharing. And thanks to our listeners out there. And uh, we hope we'll see you the next time. Take care. Yeah, thank you.